Welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Our next guest is one of the most prominent executives and pioneers in the IT industry in Bulgaria. Ivan Uslavov left his lucrative corporate career in Germany to come back to Bulgaria and help set up the first nearshore IT operations for American giants like HP. Ten years ago, he started his own company, Bullpros, and he quickly turned it into the one of the fastest growing IT companies in Central Europe. This year, Bullpros merged with the German company EC for You. Together, they aim to become the digital cloud service leader in Europe. Their new company is called Digital and is now set to conquer the US market. Ivan Oswalov, welcome to the Recursive Podcast. I'm very happy that you're here. <laughs> um, so I think we all know you from media and you're like a, like an icon in the IT oh, sector or in no. the IT ecosystem. I mean, you are there already in the beginning where, you know, it actually all started. I sometimes joke and say that, you know, Silicon Valley and the Bulgarian ecosystem have something in common and this is HP. It all started with HP. Honestly, yeah, a couple of things started with uh, the decision of HP to come to the market mm -hmm. because they created a large number of workplaces and large number of uh, interesting positions. And this was the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was like started, I think, in 2004 and then really gained speed in about 2007-8. And then we was hiring like hell and we was changing everything. And since that we are doing something like this. Yeah, I mean, we've been actually in the in the game of, you know, hiring and scaling, say, scaling fast since then and you're not doing that much different now. But before we go to the story of today, which is super impressive and exciting, I want to do like a throwback and, um, you know, learn a bit more of who who were you actually, you know, back then in Burgas. I think you, you were born there you grew up there no i was born in sofia by the way not far away from here oh okay but i was a student child means that the, my student parents then went to burgas okay and i grew up there and it was one of the most beautiful things in my life to grow up at the coast it's it's amazing of course but did you what what did you want to become back then when you were when you were supposed to be a grown-up what I, it's a difficult um, sentence. <laughs> it was very different in the different ages. Yes. And, but uh, honestly speaking, something like from about 14, 15, 16, I had a clear idea. And the idea was to travel around the world. Okay. And there was two professions at that time I was thinking will help me to do so. Mm -hmm. The one was to go to the Marine and to go to Varna to his captain school and then to go to the ships mm -hmm. and become a captain one day. <laughs> or the other one was uh, to go to study diplomacy, which was the international relationship study, okay, which, was very, the for which you. <laughs> was very famous as well here at that time. And uh, I decided for both. You decided for both? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I applied for both and I was taken in both. And the uh, end of the story was that I started to study international relationships. So you combined being a captain with diplomacy and the, you chose international relations. Yep. But you chose them again in Sofia? Yes, and then uh, eventually after the military, and it was something like 1990 when everything changed, I decided to go to study in Berlin. Why and Berlin? I moved to Germany. I mean, I was, uh, I had two choices again, <laughs> like the captain and the international relation. The one was Moscow and the other one was uh, somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, yeah. my decision was for somewhere else. Okay. And there was external, it was a German with a student colleague. Mm -hmm. There was the place where you have to apply coming from our parts of the world. And I went there and they took me and I started to study in Berlin. But you didn't only study, you actually stayed there for, 11, no, I'm sorry, 18 years? 18 years. That's no, actually... I mean, I mean, I'm still there. 
Yeah. <laughs> that's, like, that's why I'm still there because half of my remuneration is paid there and half is here. And therefore, it's, I'm still there. Where do you pay taxes, by the way? In both. In both. both. Countries, uh, unlucky. Unlucky. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Okay. And for 18 years in, um, in Germany, how I'm actually wondering this is a very big portion of your life and this is you know this part of your life where you're very impressionable and uh, everything shapes you so looking at from today's perspective what part of you is kind of german how did germany shape you as a as a person i would say professionally okay. i would say professionally i'm mostly german because uh, if you're starting with 20 and almost your professional career is done at that place, you're kind of uh, you're kind of integrated into this place. And mm -hmm. uh, therefore, I mean, maybe the professional part, the structured part of my life is more German. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the rest is not. <laughs> so the, the, you know, there, 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 that's actually very funny. I, I spent a lot of time in Vienna, which is not Germany. I mean, no, no, for, Austria is something very. It's totally different. different, although here in our parts of the world, we always put them like in the same basket. But um, there is still a huge culture difference between Germany and and Bulgaria. You mean between Germany and Austria? <laughs> no, <laughs> also, but also between Germany and Bulgaria, and you have this culture clash within yourself. How do you how do you deal with that? Oh, you're kind of, uh, let's say, used to. Yeah. I mean, that's that's okay. It's not a real problem. The more important thing is what are the targets and the thing you like to achieve. Mm. It's much more important, much more interesting than this cultural clash. What you're learning, I mean, the, the most important thing maybe here is I become citizen of the world because I was responsible for 27 countries back in the days, then for 11 Eastern European countries. And then you are almost every day or every week you're visiting different cultures, talking with different people, and you're getting used to be a citizen of the world. I think that this is the more important one than the cultural clash between Germany and Bulgaria. Mm. True, true. I like this perspective. Mm. When, by the way, when I was living in, in Vienna at some point, when people started asking me where do I come from, I would say, well, I'm European. I have a Bulgarian yeah. background, but yeah. I'm not... I'm neither 100% Bulgarian nor Austrian, so... Due to the case that there was a yeah. couple of years, at least 12 times a year in the States, I'm talking about the world. Yes. <laughs> it's just <laughs> Europe. Europe no, you're more, much more <laughs> versatile. Europe is than, more the home <laughs> You're more versatile than I am. In any case, you mentioned 2004, so it's less than 20 years since then. It's uh, sure. it's actually amazing what uh, has happened since then. I mean, I'm sure that there are people in the startup ecosystem who don't even remember 2004. So maybe you can share the story. Was not born that. I mean, like 16 <laughs> so years old guys or 17 years old. Born. Born. Not born, yeah. <laughs> so can you? I don't know. Can you maybe share a bit uh, from your perspective? Uh, perspective. How was it? I mean, we didn't have much IT talent back then here, right? <laughs> Or um, no, eventually it was not the topic. We did have IT talents always. Okay. And all the years we was famous for our IT talent. Reality is that even in the older times before 90, we were still famous for our IT talent. It, it, and IT was called electronics back then. It was it was called in different names, but but this is the today's IT or today digital skills and so on and so forth. Um, I would say that we didn't have the maturity to play the game. This was the, this was, we, and to play the game means to have an ecosystem. To play the game means to have the setup which position yourself mm -hmm. as a place where startup culture can exist, can evolve, can develop, and so on and so forth. And this is what we made, I would say, in the last, I, I even say we started really in 2007, 8. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2004 was more just uh, finding the ground, looking how it looks like, and so on and so forth. And I would say for the last 13, 14 years, uh, we just uh, made everything from scratch. Yeah. It was a greenfield operation, putting uh, the country as a country which is interesting for startups, putting uh, the country as a base for building an ecosystem, and all these things that you're seeing today, it's eventually work of just 13, 14 years. Mm. 
What I find amazing is actually that this startup um, ecosystem, very specifically for our region, was you know jump started and kicked off. Um, by the outsourcing industry. So at first we had the BPO and then we had the IT outsourcing industry. And I think over time we developed slowly this maturity to play the game like on an international level. And what does it take to do IT um, engineering from this part of the world for a global market? Yeah, besides uh, certain exceptions like Telerik at that time and some others, mm. I would say most of the other initiatives came from this sector, yes. Because this was the sector which gave the maturity to the people to start thinking in processes, start evolving in terms of the business, the business knowledge. I mean, it was not the technology skills, mm. but it was more the business knowledge and also to be brave enough to go for it. Mm. Because uh, startup means also be brave enough. Mm. Leave other things on site in order to focus on something else. You know it by yourself, by your company that you built. Uh, I know by myself and so on and so forth. And this is, this is, this braveness come, comes also with maturity and also with the grounds that True. you have. And this is, this is what we built. Mm -hmm. What I find curious is that you're not necessarily like an IT person by you know, educational background. So you studied by more nature. business, but <laughs> you become an IT person by nature. Uh, how did you, you know, identify the opportunities so fast, so early on, and then, you know, grasp them with your, you know, business acumen? I would say it depends what early means because 1993, when I was working at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, because I'm coming more from the investment mm. banking business, financial business, uh, we was uh, we had the pleasure to have emails. <laughs> Amazing. This was, something, this was something which was very new and very unusual for everybody. It was not talking about smartphones, you're not talking about all this thing, but it was like the Windows 3.1, which came at that year's. And then in about 96, 97 with Lotus Notes, we had the tools which was allowing us to create databases, to create all these things which are called calendars today and everything, what, what is driving us. And we was evolving then to go to the process development. We started with the first tools to which, which, which was, let's say, created everything you see today and we are calling this digitalization. Mm -hmm. And I was on the other side, I was on the client side in the beginning and it was a very interesting exercise especially the dot-com era it was end of 90s begin of 2000 this was the most amazing time in development as far as i remember in terms of development of technology mm. because something around 99 with the isp products we was already technology wise able to do what is called today remote work, access from anywhere, and so on and so forth. And the only missing piece at that time was the infrastructure, mm -hmm. was the network. And within, the, within this time, I moved as a generalist from the bank to the IT in order to translate the requirements, in order to help the ones mm -hmm. to understand how IT helps and to help the others to understand how bankers thinking. And this was the way how I came to IT about 96, 97 or something like this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was almost another 10, 15 years always working related bank, insurance companies and IT before becoming more general, generalist in IT as I am today. Mm -hmm. Means that uh, it was an evolutionary way and it was a very interesting one because uh, we, it was very, very interesting to see how the stock exchange globally is crashing because you don't have infrastructure and availability. Mm. And then 10 years later, we started to talk about cloud. 10 years later, <laughs> we are talking about the digital revolution and so on and so forth. And now and we're talking about the later, metaverse. Come on. <laughs> absolutely. And 10 years later, we, will, we do share everything. Mm. So we do. We will do some other amazing things. I mean, it's so actually amazing that you've seen all these developments, you know, at the I was you know, part of it, by the way. Yeah, and you were part of it. You weren't just an observer, you were actually a part of it. Mm -hmm. Very correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Very cool. Very cool, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's let's go back now to, to how you started Bupros. So you were part of, you know, at some point you came back from Germany after 18 years. 
which I can totally understand, by the way. And maybe I wouldn't say you came back, but um, you somehow also created a, a base which is here. I was yeah? always there. I mean, may, maybe it's very important to say that I was every year many times here and they mm -hmm. had some interest here and so on and so forth. I was living primarily in Germany, but I, I never left Bulgaria really. Mm. And I think this is important because I never really lost the relationship to the country, to people and so on, and also to businesses and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And therefore, for me, it was a little bit easier to to transfer from the one place. Mm. It's a little bit easier means not easy. Yeah. It was a little bit easier. Were you planning to establish your own business uh, when you came back or did you see your career path in a different way? I would say it was a compelling event, the starting of the business. I mean, it was not like that much planned. Uh, I found my first company in 1993. Mm. Means I all the time had some invests outside of my corporate life, mm. which was which I had done alongside with my corporate life. What was life. the first company that you created? Uh, it's a company called Finance Partner, which is still there. I mean, it's still my own consultancy company oh, today. Nice. <laughs> like, this company is now 20 okay. year, eight years old mm -hmm. and still doing good. Still doing good? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and then I would say it was like uh, a good opportunity because there was really nice greenfield here. And uh, we was playing with a topic which I was completely aware of my former life mm -hmm. because the topic was this talent gap yeah. and this talent war and all these things. And this was, I mean, a deco which I was a CEO here is a company which is a global leader in HR. Yeah. And before that, I was working for Microsoft, and everybody knows that Microsoft is also one of the global leaders in IT and technology. And we was always looking of enough talent. And mm. the game we started to play with Bull Pros, and when I say in competitive event, because it was between jobs, it was between decisions, uh, the game we started to play with Bull Pros was just to fit this game and to fit in in the indirect methods to the needs of companies like Microsoft, Cisco, and so on okay. and so forth for the talent. Mm -hmm. And this worked out. Hmm. Uh, Bopro started in which year? 2010. 2010. And grew up super fast, actually, when it comes to numbers. It was yeah, fair. Yeah? <laughs> it was very uh, fast. Yeah. Uh, where did you learn to manage organization? Because, I mean, scaling that fast takes <laughs> a lot of effort when it comes honestly, to building honestly, an organization uh, and even culture. With, even with digital, where we merge Bull Pros with easy for you from Germany and build digital mm. this year, this is still my smallest company that I'm working for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, talk, talking about this is uh, seriously speaking with one of my uh, previous companies like Software One. It's called Software One today, but it was PCWare and then Comparex and Software One. I had something like 350 million euro responsibility. Mm -hmm. This was my budget. I mean, I don't have this in digital today, but yeah. we are working on, <laughs> <You're> working <laughs> on, on that. that. <laughs> okay. Good to see that you're still very ambitious. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of the growth of, uh, you know, Bullpros was also accompanied by very smart acquisitions that you do. I mean, at this point in the startup ecosystem, we don't see much of an M&A happening, which I find very curious uh, from an experience point of view. Like, how do you how do you manage something like a merger and an acquisition from the cultural perspective, from how do you adapt uh, you know, two different organizations who are set off, you know, to, you know, be great. It's How do you easy. put them together? It's not yeah. easy. I mean, this is this is the toughest exercise is the change management and the cultural change, mm -hmm. which has to happen. I mean, this is this is like every company has his own life, has his own culture, has even his own wording. Yeah. And all internal language means that two companies, when people from two companies come and talk about the same thing, maybe they have different words for that. Mm -hmm. Because internally you're talking about forecast, the one, hey, the other one is about pipeline and so on and so forth. <laughs> but uh, coming back to 
our we had six acquisitions and one exit uh, before merging with easy for you mm. in the last six years yeah and it was like uh, this is like a standard for companies which are evolving in other geographies means it was mm. not uh, not very true, untypical true, true. but uh, honestly speaking joint targets okay and kind of uh, kind of understanding for different cultures is maybe one of the keys for success because there are many right ways mm -hmm. and this is something that some people are missing that mm -hmm. for achieving the target even in mathematics sometimes you have a different right ways to solve mm -hmm. the topic or to solve the task and yeah. uh, and this is this is something that you have to learn in integration because otherwise Uh, you can miss the opportunity to use the best things of a culture mm -hmm. or the best things of a company because you're just going and saying mine is better. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the people which are growing with their companies and they have to do M&A because M&A is part of the growth of the companies. I mean, M&A is something which makes sense. They have to think about and they have to learn about that maybe mine is not always best. Mm. Did you have to learn that or was it somehow you know, by nature? Uh, for sure, my previous multinational experience uh, helped me. Okay. But uh, yes, you have to learn it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everybody of us is controlling the things and is trying to, to be in charge. Mm. And trying to be in charge sometimes means that you're intending to say that you're doing the things better than the others. Mm -hmm. And this is something that it's, uh, this is the most, the most toughest exercise in all these integrations and everything, mm -hmm. because the rest is uh, common sense. There are many things which are common sense. It makes sense to add one piece to the other in order to have a better go to market and something like this. On that level, mm -hmm. it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. It's much harder on the level of uh, integrating cultures, finding mm -hmm. the right balance and so on and so forth. But uh, there's one important key for everybody. And this is uh, you have always to think that it's better to keep the best things from the company you're going to acquire mm -hmm. or the best parts for a company which you're going to merge and not to try always to say this is the right approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. <sighs> I can talk hours about this. Yeah, and, uh, I, I know, I know. And I have a follow-up question, which goes a bit more into the leadership. So having all this experience, gr you know, growing fast an organization, what was the toughest lesson that you had as a, as a leader of an organization like that, of Bupros? Which was the hardest one for you? Because we see now your success story, but I'm quite sure that it's, uh, you know, related to, you know, a lot of moments where you had maybe even self-doubt and you were afraid to do a mistake. I, I mean, I mean, in generally speaking, there are two things from my point of view, which are the toughest as a kind of lessons for leadership. Mm -hmm. The one is who is behind you in bad times. Mm -hmm. Because uh, business is a curve. I mean, it's never mm. like uh, going just a hockey stick up, yeah. up and to the sky. I mean, maybe a face for a face, yes, but then it gets again uh, tougher to, to manage and to maintain this level. And uh, I think this is why you have to really to have a very strong loyalty to the people working with. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the one of the hardest lessons you learn in life mm -hmm. is uh, how tough it is to be loyal to somebody who is not performing. Yeah. Means mm -hmm. uh, it's somebody who is close to you and mm -hmm. you are still loyal even the person is not performing. Mm -hmm. And if you know that even this put in danger something because midterm, on the other hand side, this is helping you to succeed. You know, sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, running a business for a very short time, but sometimes I feel like I have like two different personalities and the one personality is me as a person, as a character. And I Jackie attach to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you could put it that way. And then the other one is like the business arena where I have a very clear mandate that whatever I do should be good for the business. So on that level, I was surprised how clear it is for me sometimes to say, 
goodbye to someone or to say, no, we're not going to do that this way. Although as a person, I'm like, ah, oh, it's so, so hard. It's so difficult. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about something which uh, is the big difference between somebody who is starting with 22, mm. 21, 22, and somebody who has like 30 years situational experience. Yeah. How that's is it after that? Is it, you know, easier to make tough business decisions? Uh, for me, it was always easy to take decisions. I, okay. I never had challenge to take decision. I mean, even as a wrong decision, I don't have any problem to take decision. It was like <laughs> I was 16, I was able to take decision. I mean, okay. this is something either you can or you cannot. From my point of view, you cannot really learn uh, because it's it's a character question. Mm-hmm. How how? Because most of the people are uh, for them is taking too long time to judge about all the eventualities. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think real successful business cannot be done like this. You have to you have to move on and you have to take decisions. Talking is, about tough decisions, maybe that's just that's, a question. That's, that's a, another aspect because yes, sometimes it's better to take, you know, fast decisions than not take a decision at all. This is very famous, you know, in business. But I was speaking about, you know, the moment where you have an inner conflict with maybe some other aspects of your personality. Yeah. In the tough decisions, uh, I learned a lot when I was 27 and I was managing a team of 50 people mm-hmm. and all these people was sold to clients. I was alone in the office. I was so happy because uh, all the consultants was delivering on projects and everything was okay. And the boss of the company at that time came to me and said, "You have, we have to quit 10% of the stuff. Because we are stock market oriented and uh, we have to quit. And I was saying to him, why not go to the other department which are not performing that well and quit just 20 and let me here with my people which are performing well. What is this? What, what is this uh, proposal here? I cannot understand. And he said, ah, don't bother me with information. Just provide me with five names until Monday it was like Thursday what that stuff? like Thursday and he said Monday provide me just with five days or five names of your team and it's okay I was 27 and yeah. uh, I was struggling a lot I I didn't sleep for Thursday Friday Saturday even Sunday was tough for me because like it was the, the most terrible four days in my life how I will go to somebody and to say to him you're performing and you have to go because if somebody is not performing, it's easier to say <laughs> you yes. have to go. But if somebody is performing and you have to say to him and you have to go, that's tough. Did what? they give you arguments why you have to let go of something? Did they prep you somehow for no, the I conversation? No, I had to provide the list. <laughs> <laughs> no arguments. I was trying to put arguments and there was okay. no arguments. <laughs> and then at Monday, I just took the ones that I was thinking that potentially they are thinking on something like this. And I found five happy people which was willing to take the package signs years that the company is giving to them. <laughs> and then after four days, no sleep, I found out that maybe the truth is uh, mm-hmm. a little bit different. Yes. Since that point of time, since 27, it's much easier for me to deal with that things. Mm-hmm. Because and this is about the situational experience. I mean, yeah. you, because what you see is not always the same like in, it's in other people's mind. That's also very true. And you don't know when you're going to do a favor to um, maybe underperforming employee in your organization who will be perfect for another company or another job. Or Absolutely, yes. True. True. I'm actually, I, I had a, a, a similar situation on the other side as an employee where I, I wasn't exactly sacked. I was expecting it and provoking it. I was somehow sabotaging the whole relationship. In any case, it was like the best thing that could happen to me yep. because it totally changed my perspective afterwards. And yeah. just the one guy, the one guy went to Thailand, get married and was the happiest person in the world. He was sending me, he's still sending me postcards. Is he a surf teacher or something? And you're talking from 97 or 98, I'm getting postcards from this guy. I made, I made him his life. I mean, that's... <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Um, what we also know about business, and I would, you know, be curious if you can confirm it. So we say that it's actually like a team effort. So is it a team effort or... And if it is, who are your peers in your case? 
I think it's both. I think it's not purely team effort. It's both. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you have to be at your own by the decision and responsibilities you have, and you have to take them. Okay. But you have always to prepare them in a group. It's not, uh, if you don't have the commitment with the people and the commitment of the people, it doesn't matter their peers, the people working for you, mm -hmm. they're your bosses or the investors or whoever, you have to convince the people and you have to have a joint commitment. Mm -hmm. And then either before or after, you have to take your decisions by yourself. It means it's both, but it's always a big portion of teamwork, a big portion of teamwork of everything. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think maybe as a single tennis player, it's again a teamwork because you have a trainer, you have a coach, you have somebody making massage, somebody's preparing your food and everything. Even you are the performer and playing tennis, mm -hmm. there is also team effort. The mm -hmm. family who is behind you, the, which are traveling, to make you happy, your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever, whoever. This is why I'm saying most of the things in life are teamwork. Mm -hmm. What is it uh, apart from the business? Because you, at some, you know, in the beginning, you separated yourself in the professional Ivalo, who was pretty much shaped by Germany, and then you have, you know, obviously the private Ivalo, who was shaped more for the Bulgarian culture, or who knows? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Global. <laughs> so, anyways, the private Ivalo, how? What? What do you do in your in your free time to? I don't know. Let go of the of the pressure, or you don't need to do anything like. No, I, I said before starting to play golf, I'm still playing basketball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, That's a nice to, saying. Yeah. I'm doing sports and a mm -hmm. lot of enjoyment. I would say sports, basket, sailing, many things. Yeah. Big game. <laughs> Big game. <That's> <laughs> Domino. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. 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 <clears throat> um, let's uh, maybe also, you know, go a bit closer to the merger. And I find this actually very exciting because it re you reached at some point where, um, uh, so you didn't really sell your company, you merged with a, with, a, with a German company towards a common vision, but it's still one of the biggest deals that we have so far in the IT sector, which is, you know, very exciting. Um, how long did it actually take the whole process? When did you start speaking about it? Really? Eight, eight, yeah. 18 months straight, 28 months in reality. Okay. <laughs> and how did you convince them that an investment here in, in Bulgaria is actually worthy? Did they have any kind it of... It was prejudice? the toughest one. Okay. This was the toughest one to give us a multiplier, which is compatible to other places, mm -hmm. like in Germany, for example. Yeah. And... Uh, our luck was that we made a combination because we got a German multiplayer for our Bulgarian part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting, but still, I mean, why was it difficult to, to, you know, have this argument that this is like a place worth investing? We need to, to do a lot of things for the reputation. Okay. I mean, the, the reality is, uh, in order to be a safe place for doing business, we have to work on that. We have to work on that. I hope now with the new government and everybody who is involved and all these people, mm -hmm. we will work on that to improve the reputation okay. and to show stability to the world in terms of to be safe place for doing business, to have a best practices by doing business, to have the right quality, to have the right expectations, to have the right relationships in terms of finance, to have the right relationships in terms of uh, no corruption, no bribery, mm -hmm. all these things mm -hmm. are putting us, uh, when we're looking on the scene, behind others yeah. and behind many others. There, yeah, many others. Uh, we had this talk with you before that, um, you know, that at this point, we are not the place where you would find cheap labor. We are not, uh, you know, we, we cannot compete when it comes to outsourcing. So No, because we don't have the volume. We, we don't have the volume and so we are not the cheap anymore. And um, so what is, you know, the next, what is the advantage then of Bulgaria as a destination for doing IT, R&D, innovation, maybe products? I don't know. What is our competitive advantage now? I mean, uh, what did you sell to EC for you? <laughs> our, our background, our background helped us to be 
on top of knowledge in terms of what we can do here, in terms of ideas, in terms of technology knowledge, of skills, and so on and so forth. Okay. I mean, not the quantity, but the quality of it. I okay. think this is something that we do have. We have to improve the education further, but uh, we do have a solid ground, especially in technology skills mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. We do have. And uh, I think uh, what is uh, what is the future of a place which don't have a quantity like Malaysia, Indonesia, India, China, and so on and so forth, is definitely specialization. It's definitely things that you're focused in. Okay. And you're getting better and better because a big portion of the R&D budget of the country is invested into innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the real thing here is and the real challenge in front of the government here, and not only the ecosystem, I will talk about the ecosystem also in a minute, is really to decide to spend 3% of the GDP mm -hmm. on innovation and not 0.5% on innovation. Because these 2.5%, which are spent in Israel, for example, Mm -hmm. They are giving them a global advantage by being 7 million people. And, and we are also 7 million people. And, and if you have to spend it on innovation, where is, you know, like the weakest point at this? Where, they sh where should they spend it? Like where we are at the weakest or where we are at the strongest? Because we, you do innovation. No, purely in the focus areas. Okay. Purely on the focus areas. When we say the Germans are standing in the global picture for solid engineering. Okay. That's the German quality of solid engineering. That's made it machines, that's made it cars, that's made it whatever it is. Mm -hmm. This is the brand of Germany in the global world. Yeah. Yeah, something similar in small. We have to identify and define for ourselves mm -hmm. and put the effort of the finance ecosystem, the investors, the municipalities, the government, the innovation budgets, everything to be famous for something. Okay. When it comes to now digital, mm -hmm. which are the areas where, you know, the Bulgarian location will contribute the most? You probably had a, a clear strategy. You looked at the market. Um, yeah. How the how is the Bulgarian team going to contribute to the to this European success and global success that you're planning? Let's say like this. I mean, the, the aim of digital itself is really to support customers for digitalizing their processes. Primarily the deal dealing with clients and so on and so forth. This is why we specialize working with Salesforce, with Microsoft, with all these global vendors. And we're helping companies to restructure and rebuild themselves in order to respond to the possibilities that the technology gives to companies to perform mm -hmm. and to get unique selling points and so on and so forth. For that, we are contributing the full scope as well from here. Means okay. we do have people in all varieties mm -hmm. of the activities we have, mm -hmm. which are also based here. Okay. And there is no real deviation between the people. It's more the mix. And it's more the real task and the real go to market piece that we are addressing. And this is uh, uh, what we what we had as an idea and we are pushing this hard is absolutely equality of French, Swiss, Bulgaria, Romania, Germany, mm -hmm. whatever, based on our vertical-based approach to support companies from different industries to digitalize the business. Mm -hmm. Means you have industry leads which are based in Geneva, mm -hmm. and you have industry leads which are based in Sofia, and you have industry leads which are based in Karlsruhe or Frankfurt. Yeah. Doesn't matter. The most important thing is the knowledge and some focus areas where we see that the, the people has the better just to give an idea, for example, we have a cybersecurity business. Yeah. And this cybersecurity business, we are proving the business on the dark market is a security made in Germany. It means the guys which are creating the algorithm uh, <laughs> in Germany, mm. because they're, but the guys which are creating the full platform are in Sofia. Well, maybe we should also, you know, um, take a bit more of the branding, <laughs> you know, serving... Um, multinational companies i think we need to yeah take some of the of the branding efforts and put them a bit <laughs> towards us and speak a bit more about the innovations and the products and you know the solutions that have been created here so that this happens the, yeah? real, the real thing is the real thing is and i think uh, 
couple of recent examples like the Payhole guys or early examples like Telerik or some others. The real thing is, besides our business, which is more system integration services business besides the cybersecurity space, we need definitely product ideas, which are becoming a reality. Mm -hmm. And then we need to pair ourselves with these product companies. And then we have a real goal to market, which is coming from here. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Bulgaria has to get better. Do you in some way you know, align your efforts with the startup industry, with, you know, Payhawk and you know, these are a different type of companies. They are product based. They're, you know. The answer is clear. Yes. I mean, not with them, mm -hmm. but uh, we're intending to try to use them, but <laughs> as a client, but uh, yeah, we are, we are looking after, mm -hmm. we're looking after and we're helping to make POCs, we are helping them to get to our clients and so on and so forth. Yes, in many cases. Mm -hmm. And this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, you're also an icebreaker. I mean, you've obviously established yourself in, in inter internationally, you know, in an amazing way. I mean, you're, you you're having a customer base. Yeah, yes, right. you're having a customer base, which is super impressive. You spoke that, uh, or you mentioned that you, you built, uh, you created your own company in 1993. How many companies do you have now? Hmm. <laughs> it was the same question from the agency of small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. for when we was have a candidacy for a European project. And they show me a A1 picture <laughs> with all the companies that they have some chairs. Yeah. And they found out there are many. They are many. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't was know, not like, aware of this. Uh, yeah, P. Mark Dalman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like maybe 17, 20, somewhere. Like okay. <laughs> well, but, but we have to distinguish. I mean, there are different ones. Maybe the one uh, belonging to a one group, like in digital, the other ones are doing something else and so on. But yeah, there, there are some, yeah. Yeah. And still, where is your biggest passion? My biggest passion is uh, the learning curve. My biggest passion is the learning curve. My business biggest passion is every year to have a next learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> this is the biggest passion. This is not the one or the other company. It's more the development, the involvement. This is this is my biggest passion to find something which I think makes sense, will make markets in a couple of years from now and so on and so forth, and then to try to push for it. That's the biggest passion. It's so not related to the job description for one or the other company was so, never in a way this is kind of like an, an infinite game right because i mean you can always learn something new and especially now that the world keeps evolving so fast in our sector yeah but yeah. this is this is my passion yeah okay yeah, much more than uh, the concrete job description or the complete target and so on and so forth because it's much more interesting yeah and now i don't intend you know to bring any dark thoughts into your mind but still i mean if it's an infinite game what do you want to be remembered for like i don't care you don't care no at no no you just want to have fun sure. here learn new stuff don't care about this it's not important <laughs> i mean the people which like to be remembered some of them for sure not remembered for anything okay <laughs> <laughs> like I, I can swear that they're not remembered for anything okay the ones which every day talk what they like to be remembered for okay that's no, harsh no, 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 nobody remember them <laughs> cool so thank you for this interview. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for being here. And um, yeah, I wish you lots of success. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tune in next week for the recursive podcast. Georgi talks to the co-founder of Find Me Cure, Maya Zlotanova. Yeah, moving on, even when I don't believe in what I'm doing, for example, um, trying, trying to be um, uh, critical, humble, uh, confident at the same time, you know, I think the biggest challenge is actually me and it's a daily challenge. Something that, because if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, whatever successful means, okay, if you want to grow a business, the most important thing is to grow yourself. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.